Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, taking in consideration that uh, we have only one hour for this workshop, I think we should start and then uh, any other uh, participant that is interesting uh, to participate on uh, this workshop uh, could, could join. So uh, today um, we have a workshop uh, uh, in the frame of the uh, ESPD conference uh, to inclusive education and beyond. And the topic of our workshop is uh, early intervention services. Actually, the uh, early intervention uh, transition from early intervention services to build inclusive education. Um, we are going uh, to have uh, now um, the, the, in the first part of the workshop, we will have an uh, interesting presentation uh, from a uh, Hungarian member, uh, Nesting Play. But uh, this workshop, the aim of this workshop is uh, uh, to identify um, the needs of the service providers and uh, recommendations to policymakers how to make uh, uh, this uh, transition from uh, early intervention services to inclusive education uh, more uh, efficient. Um, in order to have uh, um, a positive uh, uh, feedback, uh, I would like to ask uh, all of you to be active and uh, to make this workshop uh, um, interactive and uh, with a lot of uh, with discussions and uh, uh, suggestions. Um, the key messages will contribute from this workshop uh, will be part of the um, uh, ESPD uh, 2021 declaration on inclusive uh, um, learning environments. So uh, on the beginning, I will ask uh, uh, Esther, from uh, Nesting Play uh, to, to present, uh, to make a presentation of their uh, work. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I am Esther Harshani. I am the CEO of Nesting Play. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce or share our experiences, uh, what we are doing uh, in a kindergarten, kinder, kindergarten settings. Um, if we look at the classroom or we look at any kindergarten group, what do we see? That actually there are significantly more children with atypical development than it was before. In our estimation, the number of atypical children is growing and we are estimating that approximately between 20 and 40% of any, any children group you can, find, you can find kids with atypical development. And the other thing is what we can see is that the characteristic of the children has been changed in the past years. This is what we are hearing from, uh, from practicing uh, teachers and kindergarten teachers that something, something, has, something has been changed. And then the other thing what we are hearing is that parents lose their competencies, they are not uh, brave to, to educate their children. So actually what they are doing is that they are pushing every competencies to, uh, to the kindergarten. Uh, also, there is an environmental changes. So uh, that's another reason why more and more children... E é por isso que cada vez mais crianças têm problemas de desenvolvimento e de comportamento. Quase todas as experiências... Caso todos os professores têm problemas a trabalhar com estas crianças. Quem são e porquê é que é um desafio para os professores? Trouxe exemplos. Peter. Peter what do you think why? Can you share us in the chat uh, uh, a few answers that what do you think why Peter doesn't raise his hand? I, I will give you a few, few seconds or... Is it easy? I don't know. I'm not a fan. 
Okay, this is another example. She's Mary, she's five years old. Um, what is happening? That she is cooking alone in the kitchen and the peer says to her, give me the night, I will do the salad. And then her reaction is that he pushes the other and turns her back to her. What do you think? Why does she, that, was she react like this? What could be the reason for her reaction? Again, please provide us some answer. What do you think? Why does she react like this? And our third example is Tom, who is four years old. Tom is standing in the sand pit and sprays the sand while the others are trying to make cakes from sand. They don't like to play with him because he's just placed the sand. How do you react as a teacher? What do you tell him? What do you think? What is the reason behind his behavior? Again, please provide us some answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have, we have answers like, um, he's too lazy, I mean, Peter, who doesn't raise his hand, he doesn't pay attention. O Peter diz que não presta atenção, o que não levanta as mãos, não compreendeu, ou é preguiçoso. Ele decidiu que não quer fazer, não gosta de levantar as mãos, e pode não compreender a língua, ou não conhece as instruções, não conhece a língua. E, e a rapariga que quer jogar sozinha... Não quer brincar com as outras, tem medo, quer brincar sozinha e não está habituada a brincar com outros. E o Tom, na areia, tem medo e tenta fazer alguma coisa. São respostas típicas, é isto que ouvimos dos professores. Vamos lá ver o que é que estas crianças têm de comum. Como podem ver, em, muitas vezes têm problemas de desenvolvimento, são um bocadinho atrasados em relação à idade. Não conseguem fazer coisas, por isso parecem agressivos. Por isso, se uma pessoa não consegue fazer alguma coisa, é uma reação normal de uma criança. O que é que é comum também? são aqueles que precisam atenção a 100% do professor permanente. Já ouviram que os pais queixaram-se ao professor eu não quero estes miúdos ao pé da minha criança porque são agressivos, façam qualquer coisa para proteger a minha criança, o meu filho. Nós, professor... ...behavior, Uh, if we don't change our attitude towards these children, um, we, then we are not able to help them and they will leave school very early and, th and that will be a lifelong uh, consequences. So why nesting play? This is my son, Aaron. He's now 11 years old um, and he's one of the child who cannot connect, who doesn't understand the rules. And although he is not aggressive, but he's not welcome amongst the others because he cannot play with them. He has got, um, he, he does, he, he has got problem with understanding, the, with un understanding speech. And I always heard from teachers how hard, is work, how hard is to work with Aaron. And as a mother, I suffered a lot. Just to imagine that my son is sitting alone and no one wants to play with him because the teacher, because the teacher doesn't know how to, how to help them, how to involve him in, in, into the fun. And instead of complaining that, oh, I am so unlucky that I have a son who has got issues, who, who has got troubling behaviors, 
with my peers, with my colleagues, with, with, we, we, we decided that we are going to change the world and we are, we are going to do something for help teacher uh, to get the knowledge, the proper knowledge to start uh, to involve these kids into the everyday fun. So that's why, we, that's why uh, I um, uh, funded Nesting Play and that's, what we are, that, that's why we are waking up every day to help teachers and to help these, these uh, children to be more integrated into the society. So how do we do that? The first is that assessment. As you remember, you said several answers, like he doesn't pay attention, he doesn't understand, uh, he doesn't care, he's lazy, and also with the girl who doesn't want to play, he sh she shies, uh, she's not in the mood to play together, and so on and so on. And that's why it is very, uh, that's why it is very important uh, to understand that why someone is be be behaving, why, why a kid is behaving like that. Like Peter, who doesn't raise his hands. This is what we hear from teacher, he doesn't want to do it. And then, he, and then, and then if, if a child is, doesn't want to do something, most of the time he's pushing the other's head because he doesn't understand. But if we, have, if we start to assess, we start to observe why Peter is behaving as, as he behaves, we will very soon we realize that there is something behind with his troubling behaviors. In this case, in Peter's case, as, a, as, a, as a, and the example as we brought, it can be that he doesn't understand what does it mean, raise your hands, and not because he's speaking another language, but, he, but, but because he has that problem understanding speech. Or the other reason is that his muscles are not so strong enough to hold his hand. But if we want to help these children, it, it is very important to understand the reason behind. Or Mary, who doesn't, want to play, who doesn't want to play with others. It can be a reason that she doesn't understand, again, how to, how to get interaction, how to, how to ask uh, help if she needs help, and how to, how to be around with others. We need to understand why is she behaving like less. Or Tom, who is, who is, uh, who is just playing the sand. Probably he's got, he has got a sensory integration uh, problem that he enjoys uh, spraying the sand, although other, why the others doesn't, uh, don't like it. But that's why we need to have certain assessment to understand why a child is behaving this and that. And in our case, it means that we need to assess a child during a week, many, many other situations to be sure that how can we help them. The other thing what we're doing is play activities. We are offering teachers uh, different kinds of play activities that they can help to this child to, to close the development sisters. It's not a developmental game. This is what normally they can play in a group, uh, but this is also very good to help these children. And also we, uh, we giving advice how you can change the, curricul the, the, the cu curriculum. It is very important that if you know that within the children that is this, this and that, that kind of children, need to adjust your curriculum accordingly because otherwise they are not going to enjoy it and they will be the one who is noisy who doesn't understand doesn't want to do and 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 so on our prin our principles and these are very important for us that we don't ask more from teachers we ask them to do it differently what we what we are teaching is actually is a mindset it's that you really need to go the children level to understand why he or she... As crianças têm que perceber porque é que se comportam desta maneira. Não ensinamos um professor como é que desenvolve uma criança. The development gap. And probably, as you are also professionals, you know that, that, the, that up until, I mean, early childhood is the best year um, to help the develop to, to help closing the development system because in a up and uh, above a certain uh, age it is too late uh, to help these children and also in our understanding inclusion means that these children are studying together with their peers but teachers are there to help invisibly if needed in Hungary, for example, the practices that the special education teacher is coming to the uh, to the kindergarten group and taking out the child. Now, this is not not what we believe, what what we believe in because the teachers are all day with this with these children. They are they are the one who knows best what is what is difficult, what is easy, how they can help, and so on. They just need to have uh, proper knowledge about that. And what is very important that these kids are leaving uh, kindergarten in a... saiam do, do infantário a determinada altura e o nosso dever, o nosso trabalho, digamos, a razão pela qual nós nos 
concentramos na numa intervenção precoce. Transition period. Um, it's everything what we are doing is it's to have a smooth transition from kindergarten to school, because kindergarten is a safety nest for these children, but school is much more harder. It's much more serious. It's much 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 concentrated uh, needed uh, from from the child side. So if we are not helping them, for example, with the early assessment, we are not helping them uh, to close the development scissor, then their transition to school will, will be a failure. If we, if we are not teaching uh, to families how to create a partnership with, uh, with teachers in these early years, because this is, this is the first, you know, this is the first, uh, actually most of the country uh, kindergarten is the first level when they meet with, when they, they learn to interact with other, with other parents, with other community, with other children. So that's why we need to teach them partnership at the kindergarten level. And also, we need, we need to teach everyone how to be a partner with professionals, with service providers, because at the end of the day, we are working for the same children. We need to understand each other. We need to, so to say, we need to watch the, the same TV in order to have for that given child. And another principle, which is, which is we highly recommend to, um, to consider is that, is that um, we need capacity teachers because uh, most of the time teachers are not well prepared for inclusive teaching. They, are, uh, they, are, they, they haven't learned that the, that the children are changing, that everybody, everything is changing and they haven't learned how they can involve these, uh, these children within an inclusive setting. And also there is a high expectation for every child and we need to focus on that. Um, we need to we need indiv uh, individ individualized attention, and that's why we are uh, we are highlighting and we very much uh, encourage everyone to make the assess to make the assessment and to have a different eye of the child because that's why this is the only only way we can help uh, uh, we can give uh, we can provide individualized attention to these children. Also, it is very important the relationship, as I mentioned before, how we can support the families, how we can support professionals, how we can support the service providers, uh, etc. Um, it's important that kindergarten need to be prepared for the transition, and they need to uh, have a kind of communicate with the, with school because because you know it is it is the best if professionals, if teachers are talking uh, amongst each other, that what what they should, how how, how far the uh, the children. Um, uh, in the kindergarten, what, what was the difficulties? How, how, the, how the kindergarten tried to help for these children? And then we need to evaluate whether what we imagined for a, for the, for, for a child, whether it was successful or not. Uh, and let's not, let's not forget that this, really this is our job to help these children to have a successful uh, school, be, uh, school ending. And, and we, have, we need to support them not to falling out too early from the, from the school system. Um, and especially with atypical development and development delay, we really need a different eye, we really need a different um, uh, mindset. Uh, we need to have uh, different uh, information and services, we need to be aware of that. We need to guide the families how they can, to where they can turn for support. Uh, and we need collaborative approach involving families, schools, uh, service provider uh, to really... Services para de facto poder... ...the child is required. And then let's not forget that equity and diversity. Uh, every child has got their own story. Every family is that got has own story. Uh, own story. We need to tolerate. We need to be accept that that wherever they are coming from, and then we need to uh, adjust our teaching support according to the knowledge we have from their background for their for the challenges. Uh, we need to ensure that interests, abilities, and culture of every child and their family are understood, valued, and respected. And we need to offer maximized opportunities for every children. And we really need to focus those uh, support what we can offer for these children. And we need to promote cultural awarenesses in all children. All in all, we do believe that only inclusion setting can change the world. Only inclusion setting, if we, if, we, if we teach the atypical and the typical to play together, can change, can, can turn the world to a better one, because only play is the only thing that can uh, destroy the wall between the typical and the atypical group of children. And we need to help parents and families to survive these, earth, these first years, um, those, and especially those who have got atypical children. Thank you for your attention. 
Um, thank you, Esther. It was a very interesting uh, presentation and uh, you made it uh, somehow interactive, but uh, uh, we have now it is time for questions uh, uh, by the participants. Uh, we have the first question by Miguel. Uh, does parents have the possibility of not uh, signaling special education needs when they are enrolling their child in primary school? Well, this is this is this is this this question we often receive. Um, I know that that uh, signaling special education needs is a stigma. I know that because this is how the system works. But we encourage every every parents to let to let it know the kindergarten teacher or the teacher that there is some issue because it will come. It it will be you know this is what in Hungary, for example, the private school. This is what they are doing. That parents are hiding that there is an issue for their child. But at the third week, it will come out. And then it's too late to do anything. Because if the school is not ready to work with these children, and then do what? To, to bring the child to another school, another school, and another school? We do believe in complete honesty. Because that, this, is, this is the way we can work together. Um, thank you, Esther. Uh, Miguel, I hope uh, you are satisfied with the answer. Um, do you have yeah. any questions? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Vasilka. Uh, uh, Esther, thank you so much for your, your presentation. Um, my question was not innocent, as you, as you, as you, as you saw, uh, because uh, we, have, we have this problem here also, uh, because parents have the possibility of not signaling or not sending all the information gathered for so many years on early childhood intervention and through all the documents produced. However, I, sometimes I question exactly the information sent. So it must be the, the information provided for the school, for, for a primary school, sh should, well, should empower school to, to help them, to, to, to provide the right support from, from day one for, for that child. Because when, when you're, you're, you're seeing the, the enrollments of, of, of children, it's a it's a it's a teacher that uh, spreads the children ac across uh, so many classrooms, and it's a administrative tool. It's a it's a it's a, not a pedagogical decision. So, the, by providing the right information, it provides also the information for for the teacher to to better prepare the classroom, the spaces the use of, of, of technology and the use technology, of technology uh, uh, that uh, we, we struggle with that because we see that so many uh, so much information could be provided for the school and it, it will be lost uh, how, how can you 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 work on this so either either by selecting the information and talking directly with parents and saying okay across the whole information that we have produced, we have selected these. These information will provide the right support and the right information for the school. That information is, is up to you to decide. So how, how can we improve this? Um, in our practice, what we are doing is that, for example, we prepare the teachers that when there is an enrollment process at the beginning of the school, how can they see that if there is a child who has got issues, because this is what parents are hiding. And then we also prepare them what kind of questions you can ask from parents, because we will easily know if there is something not okay with the that, with that children. Because as you say, this is very important. If a school is not ready to accept that or that child, then it's a no. It's better to say no than to accept it. And then you know be, be, be excluded from the fund because they are not able to do anything. And believe me, it's as a mother, I am saying that if, if, a, if a school is not well prepared, there is always a stomach ache. What is going to happen with my child? When are they going to say that go away, leave the school if they are not prepared? So it's not a win-win, it's a lose-lose for everybody. And that's why we're preparing teachers, we're preparing parents that, that, that there should be an honest communication because it's not good if they are hiding something from each other. Yeah. And, and sorry, and can a school not enroll a child based on disability? So 
I, I can exclude a child based on, okay, I do not have the right resources in the school to receive this child? Well, it, I think yes. I mean, in Hungary, there is a, there is, in Hungary, there is written in the paper that what kind of child you can accept and what cannot, because there, if there is no facilities, you cannot do that. But I mean, um, uh, of course, they, I mean, in, in, um, in those child who has, not, who has no paper, so no official diagnosis, it is, it is much more difficult because, you know, no one knows that. But if it has an, an official di diagnosis, then as, as a school can, in Hungary, they can say that, no, okay. And I do believe it that although it's not nice, but not every child can be included. I mean, it's inclusion, it's not, it's not good for every child. Because maybe maybe it, it's worse than for them. For example, in my case, if 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 we, do, we didn't have the option, but probably for my child would be better a half segregated school, when he is learning with 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 the same with the same pupils, but he's playing with 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 the typical children because that's the most important. They need to learn how to interact with each other. But this 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 wasn't an option. So it is not so easy. I know that many parents who have got disabled uh, children wants to push the child into an inclusive school, but it's not always the solution. It's, it's sometimes it's worse than. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miguel, for your contribution uh, in uh, this uh, um, in this uh, on this topic. Uh, we have a, a comment from Paula. Uh, Paula, would you like to to say something to to make a comment in public? To ask a question. Sorry, I was just getting stuck there with the technology. Um, uh, no, ba basically, I think that um, as as with regards to my comment, um, uh, when we're looking at um, uh, children transitioning from early intervention into mainstream schools, there are a number of factors that we need to take into consideration. Um, the principles that Esther put forward, I think, are, are common across um, many service provision um, uh, because the, these are guiding principles in relation to intervention. And when we were looking at the examples at the beginning, I think assessment would be the most important aspect because we, we make assumptions about why children may not be participating in any aspect of, of the, the school environment, but we need to understand the root cause of this, whether it is a sensory, a behavioral, a cognitive, a developmental, a, a physical problem, um, as opposed to, to making assumptions. Um, when it comes to parents sharing um, information, we often find that parents of children that are recently diagnosed would be struggling in their own way to cope with um, accepting that there is this diagnosis. And we often find that parents would be in denial initially as a result of this. And of course, we understand that early intervention is essential to a person getting the help at the beginning um, of obviously the, the quicker and the sooner we provide the support, the better. However, if a parent is struggling to accept that their child has a problem, it's not necessarily always because they don't want to share the information, it's just that they can't come to terms with accepting there is a problem in the first place. And I think here, the partnership with the parents is also a fundamental um, uh, contribution because if we can't support the parents, then they can't support their children effectively. Um, I also think that there, is, uh, there are a number of, of um, factors to be taken into consideration when a child is transitioning to mainstream education, because um, as Esther was saying, it's, it's not for every single child. We also have to consider the, the school environment. Environmental factors play a huge part in the potential success of a child um, integrating successfully in, in the school environment. So if, this, if the environment isn't conducive to learning for a particular child's needs, then they are not going to be gaining the most out of that educational experience. Um, and I think the other thing is that um, many teachers are not taught through their, through their own educational experience to be inclusive. And as a result of this, um, uh, they would have a big class of, of children to teach their focus would be predominantly on engaging those children that can participate 
and they are often dependent upon their learning support educators, educators of these other children to adapt a curriculum, whereas these learning support educators would not be teachers and would not have the capacity to appropriately adapt um, a mainstream educational curriculum for these children. So I think for inclusion to be more successful, there are these factors that we need to take into consideration. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paula. Uh, it was, uh, thank you for your contribution. It was a very uh, interesting comment uh, um, about this topic. Uh, do we have any other uh, practitioner or parent who will uh, share any positive or negative practice? Uh, uh, Vasilka, just to just a quick uh, reminder, if any uh, Portuguese would like, uh, we have several uh, Portuguese uh, participants in this, uh, so they can use the Portuguese language because we have translation into into the English, so you you can you can speak freely. Uh, you are very welcome to ask questions uh, by raising hands or just directly include yourself uh, in the discussion or you can write it uh, in the chat box. Can I, I, uh, can I just comment then, yes, uh, to Paula? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just think about the questions that you, you're about to make. Uh, don't you think that if, if schools, so for example, in, in Portugal, parents cannot decide to enroll a child in primary level at, at, at in, in primary school, they cannot choose to enroll a child in a special school. It is not up to their decision. So they are, it's mandatory. They, 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 they enroll a, the child in the, in the primary school, at, at, at their local school. Uh, don't you think that um, by not having these children enrolled on, 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 on primary school, do you think that the schools would better prepare themselves to receive the child, or is it better to, without the resources that many schools do not have, but by having these children there, do you think this would be the, 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 the biggest motivator for the school to gather the right resources? Because the children, the, the child with, with, with special needs is all, all also there. So she's already there. So don't you think that this could be the main motivator for the school to, to try to reach the, 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 the right partners and to enable themselves and empower uh, teachers to, 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 well, to implement this, this, uh, uh, pedagogical differentiation that we are speaking about, universal design for learning, and, and this, this, uh, these tools. Uh, it's a question. I, I, think it I think it requires the culture shift um, in, in general, because um, let's, let's be honest, for a number of years now, children um, have been placed in mainstream education. And with all the goodwill, they have been placed there. So there was a huge push towards um, inclusive education, just as there is this current push towards inclusive employment as well. Um, uh, however, regardless of the fact that there has been this push for inclusive education, and although so many things have been done to improve the situation, children are often being set up for failure um, when they are placed in an environment which is not conducive to their learning. And when, when I talk about the, the environment, I'm not just talking about the building and the structure, um, uh, but even the, um, the education of the professionals involved with those individuals, the understanding of the peers that are in, included in the, in the class. And I think that in order for um, uh, inclusion to be truly successful, all of these factors need to be taken into consideration. And this, as I, 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 it's a personal belief, 
would require a culture shift in the way that schools operate, um, even when it comes to um, uh, the withdrawal of children. We, we have this tendency, and I think from what I'm hearing from, from Esther and from Vasilika, is that when children, for example, have disruptive behavior and behavioral challenges are becoming more and more predominant in, in schools. And this is often a result from um, uh, frustration with the inability to communicate effectively. There's a lack of understanding of, of, of the needs, the basic needs of that child. Um, uh, the, so there are, there, the child would then be, be um, challenged by their behavior. And the first thing that people do is withdraw them from the class. And the, the child learns uh, two things. Um, uh, one, that their needs are still not going to be met. And two, that um, if they don't want to be in that class environment, they, their behavior will ensure that they are removed from the class. So we have to look at it from both the um, uh, communicative, the, the learning and the behavioral aspect as well. Um, if we have an environment which is conducive and there, there, there are opportunities for us to start implementing this. For example, let's be honest, the, and, and we saw from, from the numbers that were presented by Esther in her um, presentation, the number of children in mainstream schools with various needs um, is increasing. So um, uh, the tendency is for people to try and provide individual support for those children within the class as opposed to seeing how they can be included within the entire class. And that is going to become a resource which is gonna be unsustainable in the long term. Because let's face it, how many more people can you pile into a class? How many more adults can you pile into a class to ensure that these children are given the support they need? Because teachers are not, not necessarily trained to ensure inclusivity in schools. Now, if we had a situation where there was peer mentoring of a smaller number of resources so that people are empowered to be able to, um, uh, so that the support adults are empowered to be able to include the child more effectively in the school, um, given the educational background that they might have, um, then we might be able to better support inclusive education with a minimum amount of resources. Um, there are models of this available, for example, the synergy approach, um, which has been modeled in Greece, for example, and it's been looked at in, in a number of other countries, and it's being led by At Autism. Um, this model looks at peer support to ensure that there's more engagement by the professionals. Um, and it also allows for an empowerment approach of the existing um, team members, and also ensures that people are able to, um, to, to transfer the skills they've learned from one situation to another, especially if we have a, a learning support educator who's had maybe 10 weeks, 12 weeks, even a year of, of training. I mean, I was an occupational therapist for 27, for 27 years, and in this time, I'm still learning. Um, so if you have a few weeks course or even a one-year course, how can you possibly understand the needs of all the various children that are placed within your care, it, it, it's, it's humanly impossible. But with support from a mentor within that facility, you can have um, a reduction in the amount of children that are withdrawn from classes because of behavioral challenges. And you can perhaps better engage the children within the environment that exists as we slowly start to change the culture, which will require a long process. Uh... Thank you very much for uh, this uh, good explanation and uh, sharing your uh, opinion and experience. Uh, now in the second part of our workshop, uh, we are moving on with the next presentation by Flavia. And also this is the possibility, uh, it, uh, we will have possibility to discuss about uh, uh, the needs uh, uh, on the policy making level. Um, so, to have a good uh, uh, system of uh, transition from the uh, early childhood intervention services to education, we need a good uh, legal frame. So 
together we can make uh, uh, something uh, to change to improve the legal uh, frame in uh, on national level and the european level also uh, flavia please uh, briefly share your presentation and then we will have again a uh, time for uh, discussion yes good afternoon everyone uh, i'm sharing my presentation about the um, Declaration of EASPD, the Salzburg Declaration. Uh, why I can't move my... Do you see my screen, sorry? Okay, great. The Declaration of Salzburg was, uh, let's say, written on 2015 and has the aim to raise awareness on the importance of inclusive education environments, to identify the key barriers to inclusive education, and to provide recommendation policy to policymakers and professionals in the field of education. Um, let's go ahead. The key topics to be addressed on the declaration are, let's say, uh, clustered in four major pillars. The first one is the current legal and political framework including the UNCRPD, Salamanca Statement, European Disability Strategy, as well as the European Education Area, European uh, Pillar of Social Rights and Child Guarantee and the UN 2030 Agenda. Also another pillar that is going to be addressed in the declaration is the COVID-19 and its impact on education, which we are uh, completely aware on his uh, impact over these two years almost the digital transition to education and the role of um, education in, in an inclusive society looking at key transitions in a person's life. Uh, some of the barriers to be included in the education are related to the need for an increased awareness of the education pot uh, potential and the rights of persons with, with disabilities in this dimension, the need for a systematic modification of attitude and approach in the education system, lack of political will for inclusion, of course, the continued prevalence of two systems, the inclusive one and the segregated one, physical accessibility for uh, school infrastructure, accessibility to e-learning, use of and knowledge of technology to support inclusion and uh, uh, the availability of appropriate training for teachers and school staff. Also some other points uh, which are, let's say, uh, big barriers are access to additional support in mainstream and, edu and education system, the need to harmonize definitions of disability in the EU, and the need for data collection on state of inclusion, of course, and siloed working of, key, uh, of stakeholders and lack of uh, cooperation, which are some of the um, EASPD recommendations. The declaration will address the, com uh, the commitments of EASPD, European policymakers, national and uh, regional policymakers, uh, education providers, and also teachers, trainers, and staff. This is the, let's say, uh, brief presentation, but uh, let's share together the, um, the last slide. Uh, the ASPD is going to give the recommendations from, for the transition from uh, early childhood education to uh, early childhood intervention to education on the, um, let's say, um, concerns like promote stronger collaboration with ASPD uh, member fora to support points of transition, collaborate with networks of vulnerable groups to present a common position contribute to the European uh, policy position on inclusive learning consistent with the obligations of the UNCRPD to provide information models of good practice and support to member organization to promote positive attitudes towards inclusion, uh, diversity, partnership and uh, network opportunities. On the level of uh, European policy um, uh, makers, we have to develop clear and co coherent policy framework and um, legislation promoting inclusive education at all levels, in cooperation with, uh, per, with persons with special needs, families, education, um, education professionals, service providers, and other stakeholders, develop uh, a harmonized definition of disability in Europe. And in the national and regional policymakers, we have noted the shift pro from uh, institutionalized structures towards uh, a more inclusive systems. 
And uh, later on, we have uh, education providers and teachers, trainers, and staff to collaborate with the family and the community of the child. This was my very brief presentation on the Declaration of Strasbourg, trying to, to reach uh, everything of the presentation. And uh, I guess Vasilika is now leading with the, um, uh, with the questions and, of course, your input, because for us it will be very, uh, very important to update the, the new Strasbourg Declaration. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Flavia. It was really uh, brief, but uh, conscience, uh, conscious um, uh, presentation with a uh, lot of information. But uh, now we have opportunity to uh, to improve uh, the, um, the declaration with the, uh, the new statements and the new recommendations. Therefore, my question uh, for all of you is um, what is needed at the policy making level to support the smooth transition from the early childhood intervention to education. And uh, uh, I will ask Vivian uh, as uh, a representative of the um, uh, Nestle from Hungary to, to share with us uh, her uh, experience and uh, opinion. Thank you so much. Um, what we um, heard um, in the past few minutes, that was exactly um, what we need. So um, this is what we are experiencing in, in our everyday work. So uh, it will be very useful uh, to include in the declar declaration. Um, I think in addition, in order to uh, implement all what, uh, what you said, um, the basic the basic um, condition is uh, is uh, our resources. I mean, we we need the government provide um, enough financial and human resources uh, for implementing um, all of these um, uh, actions and measures. And and for such um, to of course to influence policies, uh, we need uh, we need data. We need evidence. We need to. Uh, documents um, somehow that um, our interactions uh, are going to produce uh, impact. And if we do not do preventive measures, it is going to cause much more for the government in at the latest stage. Prevention is always much more cost effective than measures, even if we are talking about early interventions. Um, and of course, this, as Paula said rightly, it is a question of, um, of mindset and communications and awareness raising that we have to do, but we have to do it better because what we are doing currently, at least uh, based on the uh, experiences in Hungary, what we are seeing is insufficient. Um, unfortunately, most of the um, service providers in Hungary are doing the job of the government and uh, with our own resources that we are somehow getting through grants or from, from, from other sources. Um, also, you mentioned partnerships, communications. It is important. We need to enter into more, um, more active and, and more fruitful um, collaboration with policymakers and actual um, uh, government agencies who are um, um, writing up the, um, um, the, the policies um, which are influencing our, um, our, our work. And partnerships in terms of um, families, as, as most of you also said, partnerships with other service providers and partnerships with, with the schools um, and among schools. Unfortunately, most of the things that you mentioned that would be what Paula mentioned, actually, um, we would not be able to, um, um, to implement in most of the uh, public schools in Hungary because in Hungary, there, there are almost no authority for public schools to decide on, uh, on, um, on, on, on tactical and financial issues. But that's once again, it's, it's, it's a policy related uh, uh, question. 
and and it all goes back that policymakers should somehow listen to the uh, to those who are working at the grassroots levels. Um, so yes, uh, resources, data, partnerships, um, and 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 this vision and this mindset of somehow looking not just what where we are now, but much, 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 much ahead and somehow raising the awareness and raising expectations that these children with disabilities, whatever disabilities or with just a typical development, but they are human capital that we are losing and we need to tap into it and, and, and make um, the, the best use of this human capital. We just cannot afford losing, losing them. I think uh, I stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It was very strong uh, speech from your side and uh, strong recommendations. Uh, um, do we have anybody else? Maybe Miguel? Thank you for Silka to put me on the spotlight. <laughs> well, what can we do as a service provider to, to, to really demonstrate the, the cost effectiveness of these practices. How, how can we demonstrate that it is a really good investment that in, in the long run, we will lose, we will use less resources. And uh, how can we put this in practice? We have this challenge on the European Commission level that we saw uh, today during the morning, how difficult it is for them to, to, to implement, how how difficult it is for them to use the money they have for the, the really good practices, because there are so many calls according to well, so many needs that how can we support uh, uh, you, the European Commission, how, how to better use the money and to really to push forward for, for uh, uh, inclusive education and the, the 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 reasonable use of of, of resources uh, how can we i do not have the the the, the solution uh, do, do you think of something that we can do to really demonstrate this in 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 real clear terms Uh, anybody to give a contribution regarding the, the importance of uh, uh, and need of uh, uh, policy uh, level support on this topic? We heard uh, uh, during uh, this workshop, the, I was writing the keywords uh, that uh, uh, we were using uh, today and uh, it was uh, most of the time we used the uh, importance of the child potential, importance of the awareness of the parents, importance of the assessment of the child, importance of the collaboration between the uh, professionals and parents, uh, importance of the support from the um, policymakers from the national, regional, European level. Importance of the uh, having the vision. Uh, if we have vision, we can make changes. Uh, uh, sharing the the positive practices um, can uh, uh, is giving us uh, uh, opportunity to uh, make some improvement in our. Uh, environment and uh, uh, we heard that environment is very important to make uh, uh, a step forward uh, in the change of the uh, life of every child. Um, we need communication um, to share not only the good practice but to share all, uh, the bad practice that we were faced during our lifetime or during our professional uh, work. So uh, having an ESPD as a umbrella, European umbrella, uh, we can uh, stronger, we are uh, uh, together, we are stronger and we can move forward. 
I'm very happy that uh, uh, early childhood intervention is uh, uh, going uh, up, upper and upper on the not only ESP, ESPD agenda, but also European agenda. And uh, um, I'm very happy that uh, today we had uh, constructive uh, 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 presentations, but also um, uh, communication, uh, raising some questions that are very important uh, to make uh, changes in the structure of the uh, and perception of the early childhood intervention. As uh, uh, Esther said, every child is a uh, um, his own story. A every child uh, has a, a, a story, but also the family has its own story. And uh, uh, I think that the most important uh, at this stage is uh, to emphasize the need of uh, uh, one uh, big uh, uh, awareness campaign. The campaign that uh, will uh, support families, parents to open uh, open mind uh, relating the needs of the child, relating the, the potential of the child and the, the, the direction where uh, they should move uh, in order to support the child. Uh, also, the campaign uh, should support uh, the professionals who would like to help the families. Um, the collaboration between uh, professionals and families should improve the, the, uh, the, the result of this uh, collaboration between parents and uh, professionals will result uh, uh, with a positive uh, um, uh, development of the potential of every child. And uh, uh, we are preparing that child uh, to be part of uh, mainstream uh, um, society. And this is very important for the policymakers uh, in the next stage that uh, can use the potential of the, the uh, person uh, to build a society uh, 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 stronger, uh, which will be um, uh, for uh, good of uh, everybody. So this is uh, somehow my, my wrap up of the uh, today workshop. And I, I hope that it will be um, a good uh, point uh, to improve the, the, the situation of uh, early childhood uh, syst intervention system in Europe uh, and um, to, to, to give an uh, impact on the uh, uh, declaration, the new declaration that ESPD is uh, going to prepare uh, after this uh, conference. Thank you, everybody. Uh, to the time is uh, uh, going, and uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, participation. Your participation on today uh, workshop. Uh, okay, we are still on, um, uh, and um, unfortunately, we are not in Lisbon. We are in front of our computers. It is not the same at all. But uh, I'm very happy uh, about uh, productive uh, uh, um, discussions and uh, good uh, presentation. I think that uh, we will have opportunity to have a uh, uh, presentation for, uh, uh, by of Easter. And, uh, uh, but uh, we will share um, with the participants of the uh, today workshop. Now I can see that uh, Um, can can somebody help me? What yes. is next? Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. As you can see in your screen, um, uh, the, the conference, this is just the first day of the conference. So we are uh, inviting you to join us also tomorrow in the second day of the conference. During the second day, we will talk about co-production in education, about staff training, how to tackle the digital divide, inclusion through sports, raising awareness, the role of support services in inclusive education, and we will present the quality of life index for inclusive education. Thank you again, and we are looking forward to see you tomorrow.